The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer-to-peer. Aloha, buddy. Happy New Year's. Happy New, Happy New, Year. New Year, man. How's it going? Oh, it's great. I heard you guys mention you hadn't started drinking yet, but this being <laughs> New Year's, if you had, you know, this would be like the one day you could drink before 12 and exactly. nobody would judge you for it. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. Cheers to those that are. Uh, Cheers, yeah. That are, By all that means. are already slushed. Yeah, ready to go for it. More Have power fun. to you. We'll be starting later. But for now, we needed our coffee. <laughs> Should we grab the mezcal? Yeah. Grab the mezcal. Oh my god. <laughs> oh yeah. It is New Year's. It is New Year's. I'm just on coffee right now, so I won't be too loose today. <laughs> yeah, we're we're on coffee and cannabis right now. <laughs> um, nice. sativa, though. You know, you keep keep it keep it high. <laughs> Uh, I've never found it made that big of a difference for me. I've tried both, and I don't know. They yeah. both seem to have a similar. I don't know. Maybe I'm just uh, un- not that sensitive to weed or something like that. I don't know. Yes, yeah, sativa gives me much more of um, uh, an, an energy high, more like a coffee. Mm. And indica kind of just like knocks me out. I do like to take kratom. I don't know if y'all ever heard of that. No, what's that? It's um so it's a family uh, it's a it's a plant that's in the fam uh, I can't talk this morning it is a plant that's in the coffee family um, but it doesn't have um, caffeine it has something that acts on the opioid receptors but it's technically not an opioid so it kind of just gives you like you know mellow vibes makes you feel good oh shit we should we should add this to gratuitous so is it like oh yeah um, you know I actually buy it for crypto really. Yeah, this uh, this business called Kratomex down in Mexico. They sell it what for. Is it? What is it unfortunately, like? they only. What's it's like that? Coffee. It looks like a coffee beef. No, it's uh, they use the leaf, so they powder up the leaf, and it's green uh, or various shades of green. Um, and you can buy it by. You can usually get it in head shops. Um, I would just say be careful because the quality isn't regulated. The government tried to shut it down, of course, a few years what is, ago. What but is then it called? Kratom. K R A T O M. Do they also call it kava? Or that's something else, right? That's something else. Yeah, I don't think I've ever had this. Okay. Yeah, kava is a root from Hawaii, and it's uh, it, it's almost like being drunk or having a few drinks, but without the uh, like without the intox the, the toxicity of it. Yeah, we've had that a few. There's a shop that opened up in Brooklyn over here. We went a few times. It was interesting. Um, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. I, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't go out of my way to 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 have it, but do you do you act do you drink it often? Yeah, I tend to drink it once every few days. No, oh, wow. Just to uh, just to relax. So you that's like the, the replacement for alcohol. Is it like do you see it as being similar to to alcohol? You could you could say that. Um, although I haven't like replaced alcohol with anything. <laughs> I don't drink too often, um, but. Uh, yeah, I do like Kratom. You have to be careful about the dosage. If you take too much, it can kind of make you feel a little bit woozy, almost like you have slight vertigo. So you really just want to take like a small amount, like maybe half a gram, one gram, um, and then only slowly take more until you can feel it. Awesome, man. Send me the uh, info on them. Maybe we'll, we'll try to add them to gratuitous. Yeah, that would be cool. I'm sure there's um, – maybe we can convince the company I'm using right now to, uh, to accept Monero. Yeah, cool. All right, buddy. All right, so get away, my today. Friend. And I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. <laughs> so today we're gonna start. We're gonna take a big picture look. We're going to look at monthly charts. We're gonna look at yearly charts. And the theme that I'm seeing right now is that there are a lot of conflicting signals. Um, things aren't not nearly quite so negative as they were a few months ago. Um, back in October. It was hard for me to say that the bottom might be in. That was there was just too much weird stuff going on. The charts didn't look right. And while some of that is still here, it it's at least possible now. I think it's reasonably possible that we might have bottomed. There's a potential that that's true. Whereas a few months ago, that that didn't seem like it was true. So because it's end of year, we're going to start on the macro stuff and we're going to start really zoomed out. So we'll just go top to bottom, left to right. And uh, the first chart we have is the 10-year yield. So 
you can see that this is a lifetime chart going all the way back to the the start of the Federal Reserve, uh, 1913. So you can see that we uh, back in the, the 40s during World War II, we actually had very low interest rates and we hadn't gotten down that far until recently. And then you can see there's kind of like this bump and bump and then up. And we're kind of on that first leg up if we're if you wanted to try and make comparisons the last time we were this low. And you can see that this happened in starting in 1955 and then you had the 60s here. And that was all simultaneous with inflation starting to rise significantly. And then, of course, uh, 1971, this was when Nixon severed the gold standard and then rates just went, uh, went through the roof. So it would looking at this chart, it would be hard to say that this is the end, that we're not going to go up some more. Um, but there's there are good reasons that we might not go up too much farther. Um, especially because this chart, more than any of them, is quote unquote manipulated. It's more so that the government sets the rates. Um, yes, the free market also determines them, but the Federal Reserve helps to determine rates through monetary policy. So this is an interesting chart. We can go back down to a shorter time frame and we can look at just this particular bull market. This chart is in a bull market. As rates go up, the value of the bonds goes down and it also tends to have negative recently in, in the modern era. It tends to have negative consequences for price. So you can see that we're basically in this channel right here. And the Federal Reserve is not done raising rates, but they're getting close. So it is possible that we do see another bump up uh, in this channel. Um, yeah, because right now we're not, you know, it's it's hard to say that. It's hard to say that this chart is going to break to the downside at all. This looks like a chart that's going to try and come back up to test the top of this range. The dollar index is, this is again, the yearly, you know, 12 month, one year candles. Uh, this is the lifetime of the chart. And there's not, there's really not a remarkable chart to speak of. Uh, but you can see, you know, that we are, hang on a second. Sorry about that. You can see that uh, we had this big wick right here, right? This is a pretty large wick to have on a single candle. And that that definitely would look bullish. But again, when it comes to these currencies, when it comes to bonds, they are managed. So we might not need to expect to, to significantly go up here. If we do, that movement would probably start later next year. Um, but right now, I, I do think that... Uh, the Dixie has some strength, and we'll look at the shorter charts. So you can see the shorter timeline. The one thing that I really wanted to show you guys on this chart was comparing against the federal funds rate. And again, I wanted to bring out the thing that Jay Powell said a couple of months ago that I thought was really interesting when he said that markets used to move after the policy change was made um, as those changes filtered out to the markets, but that now uh, markets are moving in anticipation of the forward guidance. So you can you can see this in this chart right here somewhat. Uh, so if we go all the way back to 1970s, 76 here, what you can see is that the Federal Reserve really pushed up the funds. That's what this white line is. That's the overnight federal funds rate, um, the, the one that Jay Powell and his team sets every month or so. And you can see that this went up first, and then we saw the Dixie respond by going up. So there was like – there was a pretty significant delay of mm, – it started going up right at the peak, but it really there was a delay of about a year or so before the Dixie started moving. And you can see that um, this is essentially where rates are moving after the policy change has been made. And then now what you can see has happened is that rates came up off a of floor of zero and which is a significant move. Like this doesn't look like much. Right. You would say, OK, well, this is just a rate that moved from zero percent to four percent. But the reality is when you're coming off a zero floor, that's actually a very significant move. And you can see what happened is that the Dixie went up simultaneously with the Fed raising rates because the markets now understand. And this is very important to understand when you're when you're dealing with markets. Markets learn. People will look at charts and historical patterns from decades ago, and then they'll try and apply that one for one today. And that's not really a good idea to do. You need to understand that the markets learn the kinds of things that are important. And in this case, people have learned over time more aspects of the monetary system, um, more aspects of interest rates, 
Federal Reserve policy, et cetera, and how that affects the stock market and risk assets. And so now what we see is that currencies move on the anticipation or in lockstep with changes to the policy. So uh, I thought this was a reasonably good illustration of that. And if you look in this chart in other places, you can see something similar, like, for example, in the 90s, um, we had so the uh, the federal funds rate was coming down for quite a long time and then finally started moving back up. And then you can see that the Dixie uh, followed it. But again, just slightly delayed. Um, so, yeah, that's what I thought was interesting in this chart. Let's go ahead and go to the daily or the weekly time scale and we can just see what uh, we can see what this bull market looks like. All right. So this is the current bull market. This was, again, Back in last year, 2021, this was one of the ways that you could tell that we were going to be entering a bear market. So because the Dixie was already in a bull market, you can see this entire time frame right here. The Dixie had made a stop and reversal starting from basically from the top in crypto in May uh, all the way through till, you know, uh, just recently until October. So this was one of those big signs that, hey. The markets are shifting, funds, money is flowing in different places than it was previously. You can see as the Dixie went down, this was a significant driver of the bull market as well, or at least significantly significantly co correlated to it. Uh, so again, we've come up, we've taken a pullback. Right now, I, I've been expecting Dixie to take another move up to the top, but it doesn't seem to be forthcoming. So um, this actually does give us some indications that we might see some positive movement going into next year. And that's kind of one of the themes is that I I am expecting that we have a really big breakout next year overall. Um, but that doesn't mean that it has to happen right away. I think that there's still a lot of nervousness in the market. So this is what Dixie looks like. If we do see the markets make a big bounce, for example, let's suppose Dixie kind of does this, the markets are going up and then Dixie starts going up again while the markets still continue their momentum on a bull run on this hypothetical bull run I'm talking about or miniature bull run. This, again, is something we'll look at to tell us when the top might be in of any of any hypothetical move to the upside next year. Uh, we'll be watching Dixie because it does signal overall like it's it doesn't match one for one day by day. But looking at it on a larger picture, the weeks, the months, time frame. The Dixie does give you sometimes an advanced indication of changes that are coming up. So um, right now, the Dixie has pulled back significantly and markets haven't really moved up. In fact, we're still we're pretty close to the lows across the board. And we'll talk about traditional markets a little bit more. Let's take a look at gold. We don't look at gold enough. Um, so this is the yearly chart and this chart is just special. So gold, the currency was gold back. The dollar was just a measure of gold for a long period of time, um, even after the creation of the Federal Reserve. And then in 1933, they had that executive order, you know, where they confiscated all the gold. Criminal. It's too bad that people didn't uh, stand up then for their rights and say, no, we're not going to do that. But anyways, um, there was a reevaluation after they confiscated as much gold as they could. And then it was flat. The U.S. Bretton Woods promised that, uh, you know, they would, the dollar would be backed one to one. You could redeem your, your dollars for gold if you were a nation state, but not if you were a person which is interesting because previously you could redeem your gold. And then they said, well, only sovereigns can redeem their gold. So it's kind of like, um, it's not like sovereign, it's kind of sovereign citizen stuff where you'll hear people talk about we were sovereigns and then the, they changed everything and put us under corporate rules. That's like a whole other conversation. But I do enjoy learning about some of those theories. Not all of them are right. Some of them are kind of silly. But anyways, and we can see this massive move happen with gold. And that was uh, started and wouldn't you know it, the moment that Nixon severed the gold standard in 1971. So we had a big uh, movement there, a big consolidation, and then another big movement. Um, so interesting chart. We uh, we can go to some shorter time frames. Oh, you know, there was one thing that I wanted to show you guys. Maybe. OK, now I don't really know what to make of this, but so top chart here is Bitcoin. Bitcoin had a big move to the upside, right, this 2013, 2014. Uh, and then a long consolidation period and then a big organic movement to the upside, followed by a blow off top. So the gold chart actually looks very similar. After 1971, it had this big move to the upside, a long consolidation period and then a big organic movement um, in the early 2000s. And then this is almost kind of like a cup and handle. So we're looking at a very long term chart. So this cup and handle could continue to play out. But eventually this thing will result to the upside. Uh, and that's 
it's hard with gold. You kind of have to be patient if you're going to hold it. You have to regard it more as a mechanism for saving money than a mechanism for getting rich. You're just um, unless you buy at just the right times, it's typically not going to be your best performing asset. Um, for example, you could have bought in 2001 and rode that whole thing up to 2011. But for the last decade, it has been down and flat at best. So anyways, I just thought this was interesting that there's kind of like this comparison. You can see it sort of breaks down. So right where crypto was crashing here um, in 2019, gold was actually going up. So this is a start a chart that shows significant strength. So I just thought that was interesting that people might be interested in taking a look at that. Uh, oh, this is a big one. I really wanted to show you guys this. Um, okay, but anyways, what we are looking at here is the reverse repos. That's the white line. And again, this was another one of those signs back in May of 2021, um, and then especially September or October of 2021, that the market was at a top. Things were going to be reversing because this is money that gets parked with the Fed overnight, just for a, just overnight, and they get a very small interest rate for doing that. So this is liquid cash. This is cash that people have, institutions have, that they can use to buy markets or buy anything that they want. But right now, they haven't wanted to buy anything with it, and it's currently sitting at two and a half trillion dollars. Now, we had talked about this before, and how it was coming down, right? That this was a sign that hey, maybe uh, maybe we could be bottoming soon. Maybe we could get a reversal. I did expect that it was going to come back up. If you remember the past few weeks, I've been saying that we need one more pullback before the markets are going to actually go on any major significant runs, that we were at resistance. I think the last show that we had, that was that was the theme. That was two weeks ago. Um, I was saying that the markets need a pullback, that this is the time for it to start. And um, reverse repos act kind of inversely to that. So in, in, uh, sorry, reverse repos took a big spike recently. To the upside, much, much larger than I thought it would, actually. I didn't think that this right here would happen. So um, that, is a, that is a sign that would say markets might have further down to go, right? So remember, uh, the, the theme of this show today is that we have a lot of conflicting signals. So reverse repos right now, this is a signal that I would say that, that's a negative signal for risk assets, for stock markets, for crypto. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. That's definitely a point that we need to keep in mind. Um, now, this could also be kind of one of those like blow off wicks. In fact, long term overall, some of those other indicators that you saw me erase at the beginning, they're somewhat kind of momentum indicators in, in a certain way. And overall, the momentum has kind of rolled over on this chart. This chart, like this is a big spike um, above kind of an established range, a standard deviation range. Um, so I don't expect that this has significant legs, uh, but, you know, markets can surprise you. I would I would expect that after this move here, um, that it should come back down and that will correlate with a big uh, breakout next year. Uh, and then the last thing we'll see on the on the macro chart is we've got the, the U.S. bonds. These are all different maturity length bonds, the darker ones being longer, the shorter ones, the lighter ones being shorter term. And then the yellow down here is the overall inversion of the yield curve. So you can see that we're going to close this year. These are we're on. Uh, yearly candles here. We're going to close this year more inverted than we have closed any year ever. This is historic. So that's that's interesting. Uh, and then you can see up here again, uh, all the rates are basically fully inverted. Uh, so that's, again, this can last, this can persist for a very long time. For example, 1994, we were almost at zero, and then we chopped sideways all the way until 2000. So that was a six-year period where rates were almost inverted. Uh, and then you can see 2008, we had, again, like another year-long period where rates were inverted. So this doesn't mean anything's going to crash soon. People are like, oh, my God, the rates are inverted. It's all about to crash. Uh, but that's not really how that works. It's, um, it, can, it can play out over long periods of time. And that's a theme that, that I've had to learn over the past few years is that markets tend to move very slowly, uh, a lot more slowly than you would prefer in most cases. Uh, there are moments of explosive growth. Bull markets can happen quickly. They can be done in a year. Uh, but most moves, especially for ever since the top, most of the moves have just taken a long time to get there, much longer than I expected. Um, okay, so let's take uh, let's zoom in here to Monero. You know, so totally fully zoomed out view on the macro. We can look at Monero. I want to start with XMR. Actually, let's start with XMR dominance. Because this is a nice chart. So if you remember two weeks ago, we said that uh, there was this breakout here. 
we were at resistance. I thought, hey, maybe it could pull back. But then I said, ah, you know, it's crypto. Stuff can surprise you sometimes. And sure enough, this one did. We closed the week right at the resistance. We closed the next week just above it. And then right here with this candle, with this candle right here, what I was saying is you want to see it confirm. You want to see another close above that resistance line. And this wick right here, I'm not exactly sure what that was. I checked the Monero price versus total uh, versus Bitcoin versus the majors. And there wasn't a huge dip of, of any of the other major coins. And there wasn't a massive breakout on Monero. I think this wick is probably just some kind of artifact from the way that TradingView does the calculation. Um, you see that sometimes. Uh, you even see it on total occasionally. But the important thing is that we did close another week above this resistance and then we really close this well we're going to close this next week um tomorrow uh above this years long downtrend resistance line so that's a big deal um that's a big deal because it really means that monero could go on a much more sustained run now we're actually we're seeing this everywhere in the monero chart so example for example we go to xmr btc and ignoring the recent data this was a big sideways triangle that we had seen developing is really a lifetime triangle chart versus Bitcoin. And um, so ultimately we did break out of that. This was a really crazy, weird way to break out of this triangle. So we came up, we came back down, we came up, we came back down, we came up. And finally, finally right here, we confirmed the breakout of this triangle. Um, so remember when I talk about, just a second ago, I said you have to you want two candles or really you want one candle above and then the next candle to close above. And you can see why that's important, because we did break that right here. But then we came right back down and we had this waffling action for a period of time. So this is why we talk about uh, once you break a resistance, you want to see it close above that to confirm that resistance. And uh, got to give credit where credit is due. I picked that one up off of Gareth Soloway. Um, I like his analysis. I like how he keeps it fairly simple. Uh, and understandable. Vic, Vic um, he was one say, of the few. Vic is, oh, sorry to interrupt. Vic is saying no, go ahead. in the chat, he thinks uh, his prediction is we'll see another 100% gain against Bitcoin in 2023. Whoa. That could Whoa. very well happen. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Yeah, I think that's actually quite likely here, quite possible. So uh, we've got this uh, ascending wedge right now. And let's, uh, so Kind of we've been on a larger time frame. Yeah, so this triangle right here, this rising wedge, this is strength. This is a lot of strength. We've been riding the top of it. We dipped down. We just wicked there, and then we came right back to the top of it. This is exactly what you'd expect from an asset that's going to break to the upside of this. And if and when this does happen, um, yeah, 100% gain versus Bitcoin could easily happen. Uh, all it takes is something like seeing Monero at $300. Monero three hundred dollars would get us there, and that's that's not an unreasonable. And obviously, Bitcoin at, at its same spot, and that's really that's not unreasonable. So we are we are at this resistance line. Um, that doesn't mean that it has to happen now, but I mean, the longer that we keep pressing up against the zero zero nine resistance area, um, that'll probably send us straight to the point one one uh, sorry zero point zero one one area. So we can look at that, and you can see why I drew these lines. It's essentially the tops of all of these, uh, right? That was uh, the May 2011. That was the first rebound um, that we had after a very long bear market. So that's why this first line is there. And then the second line is obvious. You can see again that that's the area of horizontal significance. So, yeah, I mean, eventually we are going to break this line and then we're going to go up. And if we went up there, that would be that'd be a 30% gain. Let's see what a 100% gain would look like. Can we get past Doug's 0.02? <laughs> 100% gain would, would put us right below it. By Monerotopia. On Monerotopia. That would be that would be awesome. We'd have a nice, a nice big party. That would be nice. Now, the thing that I, I wanted to show you guys here on the Monero chart is that there's the sideways triangle here. We're looking at something kind of similar uh, on the, the USD chart, Monero USD. Um, now, you can see that with the, with the bear market, we have this kind of channel here where we – you know, it's acted kind of as resistance. We'll break above it, and then we'll come back down. It's kind of acting as resistance. The next move would be potentially to break this resistance, come up here to, say, $180, um, and then we want to break this line. And cryptocurrency looks very similar. Um, but ultimately, the thing I wanted to show you guys is that we have these triangles that are developing a Monero, and this one broke to the upside. 
the Monero dominance is currently breaking to the upside. And then uh, we've got the last one is the Monero USD chart. Uh, we've also got Monero versus Ethereum here. We're in this sideways triangle. Um, I don't have any big opinions on how this one breaks. You can see this one isn't quite as strong as the XMR BTC chart. And it's little things like this that I look at and I say, yeah, Bitcoin just doesn't look that strong to me price wise. And then there's like 220,000 outstanding Bitcoin held by the United States government that they're going to sell at some point. Uh, it, it might be years before they sell it, but just the fact that it's out there, that's kind of hanging over Bitcoin's price. Um, whereas Ethereum and Monero, they don't have these negative externalities hanging over price like that. So um, longs and shorts, nothing. They're just, uh, they're just flat here. Nothing has changed. Very, very close to the zero mark. Although technically we just barely went uh, to net short. And the divergences, the price divergences, um, nothing to speak of here either. Very close to zero. That's good. That's what we want to see. Um, this action that happened here early in December, I don't know what that was all about. Um, Binance was freezing withdrawals pretty consistently. I guess this was the money run right here. The, another, another money run was done uh, on the 14th, the 15th. Um, so, yeah, Binance was kind of like freezing there their withdrawals off and on. I haven't been paying attention lately. They might still be doing that. They probably are. They've been doing it for the last six months. They're most of the time, or I should say like half the time they're down, half the time they're up. They're just like riding the line of trying to, uh, uh, of trying to keep their withdrawals open, which of course enables them to maximize their fractional reserve ratio to hold as little Monero as they possibly can. So, but again, that's kind of another reason why we can expect Monero to have positive price action because they can't go any further into those reserve those fractional ratios there they're just out of monero people want their monero so uh good signs for a monero price stock markets let's take a look at stock markets uh we got the nasdaq right here you remember um the last monero report uh the price report we did was right around here and i was saying that we need another pullback now we're basically at the lows from the past couple of months and that's not surprising this this is um definitely what the chart was saying uh, let's go to the, oh, you know, I actually wanted to go to the S&P 500 first. So let's turn off the indicators. This is the year-long lifetime chart. So S&P 500 starts back in 1872, if you can believe that. So we got kind of uh, mildly positive action for like 50 years there. And then the Federal Reserve kicks on right here. That was the Great Depression that happened after the big run-up, the 1929 top. It came back down, was flat. And then ultimately, with the current monetary system, uh, we have just had continuous log, uh, sorry, exponential growth, right? We're on a logarithmic chart over here. So this is, a, this is an exponential chart because, again, the Federal Reserve prints money. The banks, banks print money. They target 2%, which is an exponential function. So we've got this chart that goes all the way up. You can see every time that we've gotten – maybe I didn't have that line drawn quite, quite right. So let's actually just get rid of that. This has been an epic run. Since quantitative easing started after the 2009 collapse, this right here is a truly epic run, and it mirrors the run that happened um, after they killed Bretton Woods, after they severed the gold standard. So let's go to a shorter timeline right here. There wasn't much that I wanted to show you on the on the lifetime S&P chart, just, uh, just so that we can take a look at it since the end of the year. Um, okay, yeah, so this line right here is the bear market resistance. We touched that line. So again, like there really wasn't um, anything spectacular to expect that we would get another fall here. What's interesting is that you can see that the bottom and the bottom here, we're still above that. Um, so the S&P didn't fall nearly as far. And that's because fundamentals matter more in bear markets. People leave their growth stocks. People leave their speculative investments, their, their crazy YOLO plays, and they go to the safety of stuff like Coca-Cola and I don't know, uh, some of the auto manufacturers, stuff that's that has been around for a very long time, that's established, they've got profits, uh, they pay dividends. These are the stocks that people really want to pick up during bear markets, which is why you can see that the S&P, as compared to the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ is back at its lows, right? These are tech stocks. This is stuff like Tesla. Um, and the NASDAQ is pretty close to back at its lows, but the S&P is still higher. So these are very important lines, both of them that if we see these lines break, and I do expect that at some point we'll see these lines break, um, maybe uh, maybe it'll happen uh, next week where we'll start going up, or maybe we're gonna continue down. This is where I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have any good predictions for you guys in the short term, um, 
So we have the end of your tax loss harvesting. That's over. Uh, people have done all the harvesting they can. They've sold all the assets, all their losses, and realized them as much as they can. And now they want to get back into those assets. That should act as a positive price pressure starting next week. Um, however, I, I just I don't like the way some of these charts are set up. Uh, there are still problems with there are systemic risks with the Bitcoin price. And we'll get to crypto in a second uh, to look at the crypto broad view. Um, it's just hard for me to um, to think that we we're totally done falling here. Uh, let's go ahead and look at okay Z scores. So if you remember, we talked about Z scores for many months here, and this is a momentum indicator. It's a lot like RSI, and essentially we're making higher lows. These Z scores are all making higher lows here on the bottom, even as we're making slightly lower lows or almost lower lows right here recently. So ultimately, this is a momentum reversal indicator um, we're getting divergence and i do expect that we should break this line here at some point question is when maybe it won't happen in january as i said earlier markets tend to move a lot more slowly than we might prefer this is s p 500 and rsi you can see that there is some small amount of divergence developing here but that's hard to say that's not exactly right because this is the 60 percent mark and once you break 60 I kind of consider divergences invalidated, if that makes sense. Uh, maybe if we go to the weekly, we can get something better. On the weekly chart, you can see some divergence. And because this is a weekly chart, this definitely gives you the feeling of a long-term reversal, which is why I've been saying that next year, we should get a reversal that's somewhat long-lived. It, it, it won't be like a month-long pump or a two-month-long pump. It, it should last for a reasonably long amount of time next year. Um, because this divergence, again, on a weekly chart is showing us that uh, that there, there's potential for us to go up here. So the S&P would be the first one to expect to break. If we see it immediately come right back up to this area and then poke its head above, um, that's probably all I need to see to um, start reaccumulating even more. Um, I actually did buy back um, something like 7 or maybe 10% of my stack Um and I bought it into a degenerate YOLO coin. I won't say which one it is, <laughs> um, but it is a coin that's gone down significantly, and I expect that it should have another run. Uh, I wanted to warn you guys about Tesla two weeks ago, and I just forgot it was on my it was on my chart list. I had a debate with someone on Twitter about three weeks ago about whether you should be getting into Tesla uh, right around here, <laughs> and I was trying to tell him. I said, look. Uh, you know, because he said, well, fundamentally, Tesla is amazing in their balance sheet and they have no debt and yada, yada, yada. I said, that's great. But I don't need to know anything else other than looking at this chart. Um, looking at this chart, let's before it fell. This is a terrible chart. This is not a good chart. Um, and Tesla's PDE ratios are really high. So Tesla might be a great company. I don't know. Um, I don't I don't really study companies that much. But one thing I do know is that in order for Tesla's value um, or sorry for tesla's profits to catch up to where the chart is currently at they need to do like a 10x or 100x growth in their profits which is huge right essentially this is again it's a growth stock people speculate during a bull market that tesla will be the next amazing electric car thingy whatever it doesn't matter lots of companies do this and so their stock gets significantly ahead of its current real value um, and then you spend this long period of time where the, the company actually has to catch up to the chart because people, you know, they're they're speculating. So right now what's happening is we're seeing this big pullback and Musk also had to sell a lot of Tesla. And I think that he's using that to try and sustain uh, Twitter. He lost a lot of advertisers. So um, it seems like he was trying to find cash to keep Twitter going. So hopefully he can keep Twitter going. I think it's better in his hands than in the hands of the last guy's. Um, but, you know, I'm not I'm also not a huge Elon Musk fan in certain ways. Uh, so that's the stock market. Um, basically, again, we're looking for a breakout at some point here. It could happen next week. We have positive price pressure with people rebuying their stocks. Um, but, you know, sometimes this stuff happens on longer timelines than we prefer. Onward to crypto. And this should be one of the last things we'll look at. So long lifetime chart of total. Uh, it actually goes back farther than this, but it's really just um, just a Bitcoin chart. Um, let's go to a shorter time frame. Okay, so just like much like we had with Monero, we've got this kind of channel, right? We got this bear market channel where 
the bottom line represents a place we had resistance for a significant period of time. The top line represents kind of like our ultimate attempts to get above, to rise above. Now, to me, this chart looks very similar to this time frame right here. So what's happening here looks very similar um, to this right here. I don't like this chart. I really don't. It feels like bullshit. It feels like someone is artificially putting a bottom in these markets. It does not feel like organic support. The people that could organically support the markets have already bought every step of the way down. Um, but at the same time, I kind of feel like in 2018, they were able to put a floor on the market earlier than probably it really should have been. Um, there are some emails out there with Tether that they talk about they need to take drastic action quickly um, or the market could fall further. Uh, that all came out during the New York Attorney General investigation into what Tether was up to. So anyways, um, I say that to say that I don't like this chart. It looks like bullshit, but that doesn't mean that this isn't the floor. This could very easily be the floor. I don't like that we didn't get, I don't like that we didn't touch my regression line down here all the way. Uh, I would love to have touched that line. That's such an easy rebuy point. But you can also see, uh, that's, well, that, that's what Vic said. And uh, <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> Body, thank you so much. Body, man. thank you, and have a, a wonderful New Year's Eve and a happy and healthy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, stick around. Happy and healthy happy New Year to you as well. All right, man. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, my friends.